So welcome everybody uh, to my talk uh, on the taste of trees. So what I'm going to present to you is based on joint work with Lina Gantech, who's also in the audience, my PhD supervisor in Munich, and Nikos Georgiou, who's from Sussex. So as a motivation for the main model of my talk, let me start by recalling the classical model of totally asymmetric simple exclusion process, or just briefly TASAP. So typically, we just start with the integer lattice, and we consider a configuration of particles on the integers. So every site is either occupied or empty. And now we consider the following dynamics. So each particle is equipped with a rate one Poisson clock. And whenever a clock rings, for a particle, so let's say for that particle right here, it tries to jump to the right hand side. And it does so on an exclusion constraint. So that means that whenever the target is awake in sight, like in this example here, then the move is performed. So, however, when you're choosing a site like this here, and it tries to jump to a site which is already occupied by another particle, then this move is going to be suppressed. And now, when you're given such an interacting particle system, here the TASAP, typically one of the first questions you ask, what can you say about invariant measures of your system? And in the case of exclusion processes, this is a very classical question, which goes already back to the times when this model was introduced by Frank Spitzer in 1970, where it was introduced to the mathematical literature. And it turns out that for TASAP, that the invariant measures or, uh, or the non-trivial invariant measures, so to say, are actually all mixtures of Bernoulli product measures. Now, once you know what the invariant measures are, you can just choose one. Let's say uh, for taste you start with a Bernoulli half product measure and you analyze the such stationary process and ask for various observables. And well, one main quantity of interest typically have is the current. So you ask what's the number of particles passing through a certain site over time. And studying the currents or fluctuations or generally scaling limits is already a question also going back for now over 30 years. So all that started uh, at least in the 90s. And for this specific case depicted here, um, an only a half product measure for your TASAP, it uh, turns out that um, you see a KPSAT scaling. So that was shown by Patrick Ferrari and Herbert Spohn in 05 that um, you do see KPSAT scaling where the limiting distribution is actually a bike ride distribution, bike ride distribution. Now, when you have an idea about an equilibrium, so, uh, equilibrium behavior, well, somehow a natural counterpart is to talk about non-equilibrium situation. So like to pick the tier, some step initial conditions, where for example, just the left hand side is occupied by particles and the right side, so the negative integers are all occupied, the positive integers are all left empty. And now you can ask the same questions. So, and this leads to understanding fans and shocks for TASAP. But also you can ask now the same questions about what can you say about the current? And in this specific case, also now, the result from 20 years ago, Johnson proved in 2000 that again we see a KPSAT scaling with trace width and limit distribution. Now, in general, when you somehow see TASAP, you typically think of it as a one dimensional model. So there was a lot of recent progress over the last 20 years, but a lot of major results and a lot of techniques were developed, but somehow a key feature of the underlying system is that it's somehow one dimensional or you have a one dimensional graph on the line. So it might be a cycle, it might be a segment with open boundaries, but when you consider TASAP or related, related models of TASAP, then you do really require such a one dimensional underlying graph. And the purpose of the talk is now to ask these questions about varying measures, current and ideally scaling limits for the case when you consider TASEP on more general graphs. And for the purpose of the talk, this will be the, the underlying graph will be a tree. 
So pick your favorite tree, like this one here, and pick your initial configuration of particles according to some rule. And now we consider the following dynamics. So first, of our tree, we pick one site, that one here, say, and call it our root. And here at the root, this will be our source of particles. So at rate lambda, we add particles to the root. And now in order to implement the TASIP structure, we have the following rule dynamics. So our particles can now only jump in the direction pointing away from the root. And contrast also to the, well, to the simple model shown before, uh, we allow for general rates Rxy. So a particle at site X here jumps under the exclusion rule to a site Y. So again, here, if we choose that particle right here above, and it tries to jump to the right, then this move is again suppressed by our exclusion constraint. But now, in addition to what, what we saw before, we have here a source for our particles. So at rate lander, under, again, under the exclusion constraint, particles generated at the root. And now our goal is to ask the questions from before for this model of TASIP on a tree. Now, before coming to the main results, let me mention some previous work. So actually, invariant measures for exclusion processes on general graphs were already investigated intensively in the 80s. And an overview of some results can be found in the book of Liggett, Interacting Particle Systems from 85. Well, a lot of the results in there um, were also extended in a work by Bramson and Liggett from 2005. For the specific case of an exclusion process on trees, uh, there's some recent work um, together with Dayu Chen, Peng Chen, Nina Gantet, and myself, where we consider symmetric uh, simple exclusion processes on trees. So in this case, the particles can jump in both directions. And we do, uh, we do analyze the problem of attack particle in these trees and um, do that for regular trees and Golden Watson trees. And so now this specific model I just showed you, the taste of trees, um, a version of it uh, for uh, the case where the underlying uh, tree is a regular tree and the rates are chosen in a special way, come for that later on. Um, this model can actually be also be found in the physics literature. It was investigated by Mochi Shaw, Watzlaff and Evans using some mean field analysis techniques. Okay, so uh, maybe now before coming to the main results, um, let me maybe already give a short break and ask if you have some questions on the model. And also again, um, for the whole talk, if you have any questions, of course, just interrupt and feel free to ask. Okay, so if there are no questions on the model, then let me come uh, like the first part talking about the equilibrium behavior. And um, to define or to give the state the main results, uh, let me introduce some notation. So we consider tree T consisting of vertex set V and edge set E and let it have a root little o and rates Rxy for all edges pointing away from the root. And also we have our source um, with a parameter lambda at which we generate the particles. Now for a side X, we say that Qx is the net flow through X, and that is given by the sum of all rates going out of a vertex X minus what's coming in. And note that because of our tree structure, there is always, well, at most one site, um, uh, which is producing an incoming rate. So this, uh, we just um, let X bar be the unique parent of X in our graph. And um, at the root, we, well, we don't have an incoming vertex, so we just um, take the net flow to be the sum of all outgoing rates. And now we say that the rates satisfy a flow rule, 
if we have that the net flow is equal to zero, is equal to zero for any interior vertex x, or more generally, we say that we have a superflow rule if we have that q of x is positive. So whatever flows in is at most what flows out for every single interior vertex. Now, in case of a flow rule, is a, it is a theorem by Bramson and Liggett from 05 that if we choose um, the rates with flow rule and we have that our source parameter lambda is less than the strength of the flow, which is uh, Q of the roots, which is the sum of the rates at the root, then we have that a Bernoulli row product measure for rho uh, being equal to lambda divided by the strength of the flow is an invariant measure for our system. And let me also say that uh, this is in some sense an if and only if. So if you ask for non-degenerate invariant measures of your system, then the only way to have a product measure is if the rate satisfy a flow rule. And also if you compare with um, the simple example of just a taste sip on the half line, then where you always, where we just have right one, that's also not hard to show that it's indeed satisfied. And another comment on this result is that the Bernoulli row product measure is actually an extremal invariant measure. So when we're going to uh, talk about um, currents a second, so we ask for the number of particles and time t passing through a certain side divided by t, then we can indeed use the ergodic theorem and talk about the limit in an almost sure sense. So the limit will then be almost surely constant when we start from a stationary process with a Bernoulli or product measure. Okay? So now in the special case of the flow rule, there's one way of constructing a non-trivial invariant measure. So next, very natural questions now, what can we say if we don't have a flow rule? And we have the following result to construct like a candidate for an invariant measure. Um, and this is the following proposition. So let mu zero st denote the law of TASEP when we start from the all empty initial configuration. Then if we now choose the rates in an arbitrary race, but well, strictly positive rates, and we consider general parameter lambda, then we know for any choice of the rates and lambda, the weak limit will exist and will be an invariant measure. So a priori, we just know it will be an invariant measure. It might be a degenerated one, like the all full configuration, which is clearly an invariant measure. But we have some candidate constructing that way. Now let me give you an idea of the proof, uh, which is actually following a very classical technique introduced by Liggett in 75 for the one dimensional setup. And the idea is the following. So we have our tree and we now consider the tree truncated at level n. And when you truncate the tree, let's see here at level one, you just think instead of letting the particles jump to the next vertex, they just jump into the void whenever the clock rings. Now we consider the measure or the invariant measure for this finite system and for the tree truncated at level n, let me call it pi lambda n. And now the idea is that we explore that we explore the tree step by step, like this, and consider the measures extended um, by just using empty sides back to a measure on the whole tree. And using this, we can now show a stochastic domination relation. So there's a coupling between the measure for the tree truncated at level n plus one compared to the measure for the tree truncated at level n, where the measure with n plus one uh, truncated at level n plus one contains the least um, the particles of the measure um, when we consider it truncated at level n. Okay, and then when you have such a relation, there's general argument telling you that indeed, if you now consider the whole tree, you can actually take limit and this limit will be an invariant measure for your process um, 
for your taste up uh, on the whole trip. Okay, so with this solved attempt, let's come to the first main theorem. And this is about positive linear currents. So let jt be the number of particles passing through the root until time t. And that we assume that the rates satisfy a superflow rule. So just recall whatever flows out is at least the amount of what flows in. And then for lambda being uh, strictly less than the strength of the flow and setting rho equal to lambda by, um, divided by the strength of the flow. Then if we start now from the all empty initial configuration, we do know that we have almost surely a positive linear current. So the limit of jt divided by t will be strictly positive and it will be at least lambda times one minus rho. Okay, and now how to show this? I'd also like to give you a sketch of the proof and this works by a flow decomposition. So the idea is the following. So starting from the root, we explore our tree and we look at the first site, which does not satisfy a flow rule, but satisfies a superflow rule. So that one here. And then we look at this site here and look at the outgoing rates, uh, in the whole subtree here, and um, decompose the rates in such a way, such that here depicted in black, we have a flow rule, while we have some additional flow here marked in blue. And now we add sources to all these vertices in the following way. Namely, when we look at the strength of flow here, so in this here, a rate of five going in and a rate of 10 going out, we have the same ratio also here. So we add a strength of one going in and a strength of two going out. And by adding all these sources, we create, so now on the same tree, a lot of flows. And for all these flows, we know by bramson liggett that the Bernoulli rho product measure is an invariant measure. And now also for the whole system, where we have all these sources, the Bernoulli rho product measure will be an invariant measure. And now we use a coupling argument because by adding these sources, we just put more particles in the system. So this will make it harder to create a flow on the root, uh, to create a current at the root, sorry. And so by using a coupling comparison, we do see that here we are still dominated by the Noli row product measure at this specific site, so at the root, when we um, remove the sources. And so it's possible that at re uh, at, um, we have a current at, um, uh, which has at least the amount of one minus rho coming from the predomination times the strength flows in this case here five. Okay, so now when we have this result with a positive linear current, we have several consequences of this result right away. And the first one is the fan behavior of tasting of trees. So let me denote by Zn all the sites in the tree at distance n from the root. And when we now impose a superflow rule, and also some growth assumption on the tree, namely that it grows most exponentially fast, then if lambda is less than the strength of the flow, we can give a criterion to see a fan behavior. Namely, if we now look at the number of sites at generation n and compare it to the minimal rates for a tree. So if this goes to infinity, so somehow if the particles compared to a flow rule exit too fast, uh, go too fast into the tree, then we see a fan behavior. So if we consider the density in equilibrium, so the number of particles which are occupied under a measure of high lambda, divided by the total number of particles in generation n, and we send n to infinity, then this will go to zero. So somehow the particle density fades out. Now, on the other hand, if we have the same assumption and also some slightly additional assumption and we are uniformly bounded degree for our tree, then if we have that the limb soup of the number of sites at level n times the maximal rates is less than infinity, so we're somehow more or less in the regime of flow, then we do see a positive density. So in particular, 
the expected number of sites occupied divided by the total number when we take n to infinity, this will be strictly positive. And both of these results are not too hard to show um, using the, um, the theorem from before of positive linear current under superfluid. Um, now, yeah. Can you go to the previous slide? Sure. Yeah. Why do you need the tree grows at most exponentially? Um, that's an assumption to make uh, somehow this condition a bit more relaxed. So you can also ask for more, uh, allow for more general growth, mm -hmm. but somehow we want um, that if you look at generation n and you look at several generations upon it, then some of the tree is not exploding crazily. So somehow all the rates here are implicitly controlled from level n to level n plus something. And okay. we don't want this something to be gigantic. So yeah, that's the reason. So also, I, um, so there are several ways to relax it, but uh, I think this, yeah, this is just to make this criterion simpler. You can also say, okay, you want that you compare here the rates not in generation n, but for some generation m, uh, which is a bit larger such that, n, uh, such that m minus n goes to infinity. Then the same would work without this additional assumption of exponential, at most exponential growth. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so any more questions? Okay. So if not, let's move on to like the third bit. And this is blockage for traceable trees. So we saw before that, okay, if you have a superflow rule, you might see a fan, you might see um, positive density, but now we can also create like blockage and it goes as follows. So when we now uh, look at our tree and have some positive rate lambda, we can now also allow for general start uh, for general initial configuration. So if now the rates satisfy what we call a global subflow rule, so this means that if we look at the sum of all the rates at generation n, and this sum goes to zero, so somehow we are below the flow rule and in a weaker sense than before, then we actually can uh, obtain that we have almost surely uh, not a positive linear current. So the current will be sublinear. And also in this case, the limit, uh, the invariant measure pi lambda will be degenerated in the sense that it's just the Dirac measure on the all full configuration. And this is actually pretty immediate to see um, when looking at the following picture. So when you, instead of looking at the current at the root, you consider the number of particles passing through generation n. And for a finite n, finite but large, these two quantities will, when normalizing by the time, be the same. So we just have a finite amount of particles until generation n. So it suffices to show that the current through generation n goes to zero when we take n large. But now, we can just compare with a Poisson process. So because of our assumptions that the sum of the rates goes to zero, if we just think of all the particles whenever attempting a jump from generation n to generation n plus one, that this jump is actually performed. So if we pretend that all these jumps are successful, then we also know, okay, we can just bound it by Poisson process uh, having the rate um, uh, with, uh, with rate being the total sum of the, um, of the different rates here. And well, by our assumption, this will go to zero. So take n large, and we will see that um, we cannot have positive linear current. Okay, so with this, let me now come to some open problems. So we saw before, we can say something in the case of super and subflow rules. But the natural question is to ask, what can we say if we don't have a superflow? Uh, we don't have a subflow rule. And well, you can come up with certain artificial examples where some, of, some part of the tree has a superflow rule, some part has a subflow rule. But we would like to understand it more for like a mixture 
as in the tree. Okay, and the next natural question is what can we actually say about this measure pi lambda and respectively about the quantity of occurrence? So in particular, do we have some kind of matrix product ansatz like in the one dimensional case, which would allow us to say more about uh, this measure um, pi lambda and also the current. And also we have the following conjecture, which should be compared to the one dimensional case. So if we have that lambda is equal to rho times the strength for flow for some rho, and we assume that a flow rule holds, then when we look at what's the probability to see a particle, when you look deep into your tree, then we expect that this is going to be rho, uh, this probability is being equal to rho, if rho is less than a half, and a half if rho is big or equal than a half. And if you consider just the TASEP on the half line, this is actually known, and they use typically the matrix product ansatz or some version of it. So that's already resolved by Liggett from 75 that this holds. Now, the question is, or that's the conjecture, that this also holds when we consider flow rules on trees, but we don't know. Okay? So maybe also at this point here, it's a good point to make a short break and take your questions, if you have some. So I have a question. Um, yeah. You mentioned uh, the possibility of a product uh, matrix answers, but uh, yeah. in, uh, usually the, in the, the one-dimensional case, the product, uh, the matrix answers is, uh, is it on the open case, right? Well, usually if you just look at uh, what you usually would introduce as a matrix product ansatz, that's for the open case with, uh, on the finite segment. So you look at TASAP and you have one source and you have one sink. That's, so somehow at the rate lambda things jump out and at the rate lambda prime after your segment of size n, things will jump out at rate lambda prime. And then you somehow use this and extend it to the half line. So here it would also be like already a matrix product ansatz for the truncated tree. But let me maybe also say at this point that already if you think of the simple situation of just having some segment, then you split into two, then you continue and you have two things jumping out. Already there a matrix product ansatz would be very interesting. Or yeah, already in the, in the three, three vertex case. Yeah, three vertex case. So you can do computations uh, when you just have exactly like one vertex, so like just like a little star. Um, but yeah, it would be nice to have it in a general setup. Okay, thank you. Um, cool. I have another question. So um, can you also extend your results to directed acyclic graphs rather than just trees? Um, that's a very good question. Um, the thing is that um, for already the existence, uh, we do really need that. Um, so, so this Liggett construction I showed you mm -hmm. before, already there we do need the tree structure. So, f but I think okay. you can extend it. Um, mm -hmm. You just have to work harder. Okay, <laughs> good. I think it's in principle doable, but that's a very natural thing to ask. So that mm -hmm. would be like a next step. Uh, I think it should be it should be doable, but yeah, it might be a bit more tricky and need some different construction, at least for existence and then mm -hmm. also for the other arguments. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so if there are no more questions, let's maybe move on to like the second part um, and ask. Uh, so we're which is going to be about the non-equilibrium situation. And the goal is now to consider the following situation. So we start again with our tree and we consider it to be initially completely empty. And now we wait for the first n particles to enter the tree. So what can we now say about the motion of the first n particles? And in order to consider this question, I'll need 
bit more special setup. So we will have the following basic assumptions, namely that we consider a supercritical Golden Watson tree without extinction, and that we have uniformly elliptic and exponential decaying rates. And let me define what I mean by that. So I'm assuming maybe some of you are not so familiar with Golden Watson trees. So for a Golden Watson tree, we have the following construction. So we start off with, our initial, with one initial site, which will be our root, also our source. And then according to some distribution on the natural numbers, we draw a number of children. So in this example here, three children. And we assume that this offspring distribution is in such a way that we always have at least one descendant, so at least one offspring. And also with positive probability, we have at least two offspring. So this will then lead us to a supercritical golden Watson tree without extinction. But now for each of these children here, we again draw according to the same distribution, but independently, a number of children. So say one here, two here, three here. And then again, for all the children, we draw number of children and continue to do so. And now for such a Golden Watson tree, we first choose the tree, keep it fixed, and then define our taste of on it in the way we saw before. So we again have our root, and again, with particles are only allowed to jump away from the root, so from side x to side y at a rate rxy. Now, once keeping the tree fixed and considering our setup, so we are here also have some flexibility to choose our rates. And for the rates, we have the following two basic assumptions. So the first assumption is uniform ellipticity. So that means if you consider the ratio of, uh, or the minimal possible ratio of two outgoing rates from the same vertex x, so the minimal ratio rxy um, divided by rxz, then we assume that this is uniformly bounded by some epsilon between 0 and 1. Now, well, for the next assumption, uh, which is exponential decay, uh, we assume something about the minimal and maximal rates in every generation. So we assume that both the minimal possible rate and the maximal possible rate are both having an exponential growth. And let me say that this lower bound here is actually necessary for what will come in a few slides. So this is an assumption we cannot relax, but if you think of what we saw before, it's also quite natural. So somehow if the rates are decaying way too quickly, then we are in the case of blockage. So somehow everything will then pile up. Let me say that this above assumption here is just for simplicity, uh, for presenting this, uh, the results of the talk. So you can actually relax that up to constant rates. And depending on what bounds you can give on your maximal rates, how they decay, our results will change a little bit. Okay, and so for now, let's assume we have a Golden Watson tree and our two basic assumptions. And one example of a tree which would actually satisfy all this is the homogeneous DRE tree which is actually also the model considered uh, by the physicists mentioned before, uh, where they do the mean field analysis. So in this special case, you always have here, so that would be the two array tree, you always have exactly two offspring, and we consider a flow rule with equal splitting. So here we split our flow into two, so rates a half, then again we split into two, having quarter, and so on. So this would be one example of a tree, which is already covered. And let me also say that our results are already new for the special case of a homogeneous DR retrieval flow rules. Okay, so now in order to state the result, let me introduce some bit of notation. So we denote by JMT the current through level M until time T, and just abbreviate call the minimal rates generation M, R, M min, and the inverse of it by capital R and min. And now for the i-th particle entering the tree, 
let little zim denote the unique site which is occupied by the particle in generation m. So by our assumption that we always go away from the root, this will be uniquely determined. And now we consider the event dnm, which means that we ask that the first n particles all exit through different sites at level m. So somehow this means they are all disentangled. So somehow after generation m, they are all living on different trees and continue their movement. And we will now assume that there exists some deterministic sequence mn such that dn of mn holds p almost surely for all n sufficiently large. So this means that for all n sufficiently large, we assume that for this sequence mn, we almost surely have that the particles will be disentangled by generation mn. And for the second, we just assume that we can find such a sequence. I will come to that back in a few slides. Now we have the following theorem about the current, so about the motion of the first m particles. So now recalling our basic assumptions, so Gordon-Watson tree, uniform ellipticity, and exponential decay of the rates, we now take a sequence of generations, ln, which are all bigger than the disentanglement generation mn, fix some parameter lambda. And then when we now look at the current going through this large and larger generations, ln, then we can now give a time window, g low, t up, such that at the lower window, we see no current at that generation, while at the upper uh, window, we do see a positive linear current. And these uh, times t up, t low, are explicitly given in the following sense, namely that t up is a constant times n times um, the inverse minimal rates at the disentanglement generation mn. So in particular, you can think of it as the minimal amount of time it takes to jump, to make one jump from generation mn, plus the minimal time it takes um, uh, oh, sorry, the maximal time it takes, it's the, it's the inverse, it takes to make one jump from generation ln, which we're actually considering. Okay. So now for proving this, let me give you a sketch of the idea to show that. Now for the lower bound that we have no current that generation, this is a, a rather simple argument. Remember we compare to independent random walks on the tree using the maximal possible rates. So the, going the fastest to the tree possible. And we do it in the way that we think of it whenever a particle in taste attempts a jump from level L to level L plus one, this particle actually performs the jump in our independent random walk setup. So what we're ending up with is just the maximum of n independent random walks, which have jump rates exponential uh, or e to the minus l c up to go from level l to l plus one. And that's just uh, a chain of bound argument telling us that at the specific time just stated, we do not see any particle reaching our generation of interest. Okay. So now for the upper bound, which is a bit more involved, the idea is to compare with a slowed down dynamics where we only let a particle jump once it, once it has reached the disentanglement generation. Or somehow we only let the next particle jump once the previous one has reached the disentanglement generation. And it goes as follows. So the first particle, when it comes in, just performs jump. So let's, go, let's say it goes up. And once the particle is in the tree, the root is going to be plucked. So no other particle can, can come in until this particle here made it to the disentanglement generation. So in this example here, we consider three particles, so it has to make it to generation M3. And then the root is again released, so the next particle can come in and also perform its jumps, go so on. And more, might also be that the first particle continues its jumping, so it might jump out of the system. And again, 
once the second particle has reached the disentanglement generation, the root is again released and the next particle may come in and start its journey. Okay? And now for this slowdown dynamics, which will give us a lower bound on the current for the original system, this one is a system we can actually study using inhomogeneous last passage percolation. So we can show that this model here has an equivalent description as an inhomogeneous last passage percolation model with the rates depicted like here. And we restrict ourselves to paths which are contained in the set AMN, which consists of all, um, uh, of all um, positions U or of all coordinates U consisting of U1 and U2, where the second coordinate is at least U1 minus um, MN, so our disentanglement generation. So now we can use last deviation theory for last passage percolation to understand the slowdown version of our TASAP, which again then gives us a bound on the original setup for the current. Okay, so that's for uh, that's the sketch of the proof for um, the theorem. Now, a key question which remains is when do the first n particles actually disentangle? So remember, we just claimed before that we can find some deterministic sequence mn such that the particles do have do disentangle at generation at this generation for all n sufficiently large, almost surely. Now the question is, what can we actually use as our sequence of generations mn? And it turns out that under the basic assumptions on the tree and the rates, we can choose mn to be a constant times log n. And this is somehow the heart of our paper, that we can really quantify when the particles disentangle. And let me also show you that this is a direct implication on the theorem I just showed you. So under the basic assumptions, it suffices actually to consider sequences of generations, ln, which are at least c times log n, and c taken from before. And also let me say that this is a very natural thing which you would expect. So let's think of it as just independent random walks. Well, because of our golden Watson tree structure, you will need at least all the log n steps until you have at least n vertices at that level where the particles could enter, they could exit from different sites. So somehow in terms of the order, this is the best possible to hope for this lower bound of c times log n. And again, we just, um, in this case, for, uh, for our generation Ln, we can give a window, a time window t low t up, at which we observe the transition from zero current to positive linear current. And also you see here that the times t up now, uh, that the time t up now simplifies in the way that we see the same e to the c low now times ln plus some polynomial term, which is now coming somehow from uh, the inburn that we do need to disentangle. Okay. So in the remaining time, let me give you an outline of how to prove this, how to prove the disentanglement theorem. And the argument will be divided into three steps. So the first step is to give an a priori bound on the disentanglement, which will be a purely combinatorical argument. Then in the second step, we analyze the time it takes until n particles have actually entered the system and consider the farthest generation occupied by some particle at that time. And then the last step, we use the a priori bound, but now for a reduced number of particles. Okay, so let me start with the first step. And this is the following proposition. And now for this proposition, it's rather general. So think of your favorite tree. We just need that condition UE holds and some growth conditions on the tree, but which can be relaxed. Now, if we have our condition UE, so the uniform ellipticity, then we have that the probability that the first n particles are disentangled by generation m is at least one minus 
n squared times 1 over epsilon plus 1 to the power fm minus n, where fm is the minimal number of sides of degree at least 3 on a, on a ray connecting the root and generation m. And if you think of golden Watson trees, this fm so will be typically of order m, at least for supercritical golden Watson trees without extinction. So in particular, this already tells you that for n particles to disentangle, you will, with this a priori bound, have to wait um, at most order n generations until they disentangle. That's not quite what we want, but it's, uh, but it's a first bound. Okay, so let me give you a sketch of the proof here. And the idea is the following. So we will use a union bound and just now analyze the probability that two particles exit through the same site. And because of the TASIP structure, the motion of, let's say we consider particle i and j, and i is less than j, the motion of the first particle, of particle i, will not be influenced by the motion of particle j. So in particular, it suffices to analyze the probability that once we thick, fix some trajectory of a particle, that another particle coming later on will not follow this specific trajectory. So we analyze this probability. And we analyze it now in the following way. Namely, I claim that every time a particle has the option to somehow jump away with positive probability to do so, well, this is, um, it will do so with probability at least one divided by one over epsilon. And this is um, actually happening when, uh, or this is true because of our assumptions of uniform ellipticity. And what does it now mean to have the opportunity to jump away? Well, consider the situation here. So we have one predetermined trajectory, the clue one here. Now, if at the time when this particle here arrives at this site, there is another site which is not on the trajectory and is empty once this particle arrives, well, then we do have this opportunity to jump away from the trajectory. And I claim now that there are at least fm minus n minus the number of particles, many such opportunities to jump away. Why is there so? Well, let's say this particle here would be one step ahead. Then it would maybe block off the jump of this particle. So let's say it would like to jump away, but because there was a particle, it couldn't. So it had to follow the trajectory. But now there was a particle causing this effect. And somehow there are at most n particles which can cause it, such an effect. And once one particle caused somehow the jump to follow the trajectory, then this particle is out. So every particle can act like such a blocker at most once. Well, there might be the special situation that you fall ahead of the, uh, um, that you follow exactly ahead of the trajectory here, this one particle. But um, if you do the combinatorics and just figure it out, each particle can be at most once such a blocker, essentially. Okay, and so then you just count and see, okay, this is giving us the bounds just stated. Okay, so now let's go to the second step. So let tau n now be the first time at which n particles have entered the tree. And let kappa n be the furthest generation reached by a particle by time tau n. And claim now the following proposition. So under our basic assumptions, and here now really both um, the assumptions on the tree and also uh, the, all the both assumptions on the rates are needed, then we have that there are constants C1, C2, such that the time tau n will almost surely, for all n sufficiently large, be uh, bounded by a polynomial in n, while the, uh, while the position kappa n will be at most logarithmic in that, okay? And how to see this? Well, the idea for the proof is to follow the motion of an empty site back to the root. 
So instead of thinking of the particles entering, we think of the empty sites exiting. So just by counting argument, you know that in distance for, for Golden Watson D in distance at most for the log n, there has to be some empty site. And yet then you just take the closest and follow its motion back to the root. And this will can show that this will take at most a polynomial amount of time by our assumptions on the rates. Now we just do that n many times. So we still are polynomial in n. And at the same time, because the rates are decaying exponentially fast, we do know that our particles, and again taking just the union bound, cannot have entered too deep into the tree. So this is giving us the logarithmic term here. Okay? So we see after a polynomial in n amount of time, the particles, all the first n particles are entered, which we want to consider, and they are at most at a distance of log n. Now we put things together. So we now use the a priori bound, and I claim it suffices to use the a priori bound for at most um, the um, for most C2 times log n many particles. So by our previous proposition, we know that they are all concentrated so here for four particles for n large enough up to this generation, which is logarithmic in the number of particles. And now we use the a priori bound for all the particles which are now entering here at this generation. So it might be there's already a particle sitting, but all these might then come in according to some rule. But now starting from this generation here, we use the a priori bound. So we think of all the particles here, which might, which might enter along this ray. And here, again, we use, um, we just focus on this side and ask, okay, how much time does it take after that side to disentangle? And the nice thing is now, because of our uh, observations, we just have to consider log n, all the log n many particles, which, might, which may, um, so all the log n many particles out of the first, or, um, or out of the first n particles, which might, which might exit through this point here. So using the a priori bound, we also know that there are only an additional order log n steps needed to make them actually disentangle. And putting this all together, we see that in total, an order log n of depth under our basic assumptions suffices for the first n particles to disentangle. Let's finish the proof. Okay, so let me now conclude. Uh, talk with coming to some open problems. So the first open problem is what can we actually say more precisely about the current? So before we saw, okay, we can give a window at which we observe transition from like zero current to positive linear current. Can we be more precise? And also you can ask like a dual question. So you can think of as your time as fixed, and ask for a window of generations where you find your particles. So when you have more knowledge about your tree, so for example, in the special case of a homogeneous DRE tree with, um, our, yeah, with our nicely chosen rates, we can be more precise and actually give conditions on the rates such that we have um, a time window or a generation window which agrees in first order. But it would be nice to see what can we do for more general trees. Now the second question is, what can we say about the exit points of the particles? So now speaking in terms of the disentanglement generation. So we saw, okay, they will disentangle, so at least on our assumptions, under, uh, after, some um, after some log n, or the log n many, uh, many generations, but we somehow had to give up where exactly among this, uh, at this generation they, would, uh, they will enter. So maybe there's like some structure which we can exploit, which would also allow us to be then more precise about instead of using maximal and minimal rates, to really use different rates within the tree, combine that into the proof. And also going into this direction, we have the following question. Um, namely, when you have particles within your taste and you ask, where do they disentangle? or more precisely, you ask for the probability 
that n particles are disentangled after a certain generation. Is it actually the case that if you compare TASAP to independent random walkers, where the particles just follow the rates and just choose accordingly, and you compare the probability that independent random walks disentangle at a certain generation to the probability that particles in TASAP disentangle at a certain generation, is it true that the probability for the particles in TASAP to, uh, to disentangle is at least the probability of independent random walks to disentangle? And it turns out for two particles, or for n equal two in the setup, it's actually true. But already for n equal to three, we don't know. That would be very interesting to see. Okay, so with this, I'd like to conclude. So thank you very much, and I'm up for taking your questions. Thanks, Dominic, for the talk. So if anyone has questions, they can unmute themselves. So I have a question like, so can you go to the slide where you define the tau n and kappa n? Uh, is that again? Uh, yeah, this slide. So mm -hmm. you, under the assumption of exponential decay, you are saying you can relax the assumption of upper bound, right? Uh, yeah, that would have an impact here. So here yeah, you so, really need the basic assumptions. But your uh, some form of the theorem still holds if you have constant bound, right? So what is that bound? Uh, you mean that one here? Yeah. Um, uh, you can do it explicitly. So somehow it's you look at the generation. So um, you look at a generation at which uh, the rates um, are somehow polynomially small for some mm -hmm. very specific polynomial, which we can give very explicitly. Okay. So this thing here, so instead of C2 times log n, this will be some generation at which um, the rates look like n to the, um, look like n to the minus um, 15, let's say. And some other, con so the exponent of your polynomial will depend on your assumptions on the rates and also on your offspring distribution. But we can do that very explicitly. And where exactly do you use the fact that you have a, like it doesn't decay too fast, like super exponentially? Um, that's uh, also here implicitly. So if you say, okay, if they decay too fast, you might have to wait for an enormous amount of time until things get in. Okay. So that's somehow also used here. So you really need to balance it somehow. Mm -hmm. So somehow you need a decent amount uh, that the, such that the particles can go in and they will actually go in. And at the same time, you want that they don't go in too far, too far so you don't lose them. Mm -hmm. I see, thanks. So do you see the existence of uh, some scaling limit, for example, by taking uh, some special graphs to see some, some nice scaling limit, for example? Yeah, we, uh, we would hope so. Um, that's, uh, that's a very good question and it's planned for future work. So especially in the case of homogeneous tree, there might be something up. Also what we saw before uh, with this matrix product and such. So, um, there should be something. So we don't have the results yet, but I'm optimistic that you can say something under sufficiently nice assumptions. So for example, so you have not considered the questions of, uh, I don't know, for example, hydrodynamics? No. Yeah, that, um, yeah, that would probably be more related to like the first part. So understanding this measure um, pi lambda more precisely. Mm -hmm. So this, so that what you're asking with hydrodynamics, that's exactly this question. So what is the density in the long run for your system at a certain point? So, well, we, we do have the conjecture in the flow case and um, yeah, let's see. So this entanglement in, the, in, the, in this uh, large scale limit will be some sort of diffusion. 
Uh, that's a good question. Uh, how this actually looks in the long run. Um, my cats. Uh, yeah. So it's somehow. Yeah. It, it's natural to the system. So what we just saw about that. Well, the first n particles, just by the a priori argument. Um, this is somehow the minimal assumptions you need is some kind of uniform ellipticity. Um, so under these assumptions, the first n particles will eventually disentangle. We can give a bound on it. It's just not the bound somehow we, what we expect when comparing to independent particles without the exclusion constraint. So yes, yeah, so somehow they, they will disentangle eventually. The question is somehow, yeah, when? And yeah, it might be some, but there's some diffusion underlying. Yes, 